Hi, um, welcome to Fem Blog. This is Saint. There's something that has been bothering me. In fact, at the point I got so livid about it, and that is this: Why is it that when something bad happens to somebody, the first thing we think is what did that person do? That's the first thing that crosses our mind. What did that person? He must have done something wrong. He must have sinned. Or on the flip side, when something bad happens to you, you start checking: What did I do? I must have done something wrong, or maybe because I had this tight, or maybe because of that sin, or maybe because I wasn't too faithful in church, or because I've been missing church, or one thing or the other. Then the worst is those leaders in church now make it worse. They say it's because of this and that and that in your life. That is why this happened to you. Because of that and this and that, that's what happened to you. It gets me livid. It is a show of ignorance of the personality we serve. We don't know who we serve. We don't have any revelation of the God we serve. That is why we come up with all kinds of nonsense as reasons why bad things happen to good people. You know, a good example whenever we talk about this is, is Job. So my question to you is, what did Job do? Name one thing Job did wrong. You know, we've built doctrine around Job's suffering. And the Bible may declare in the first verse of the first chapter, of the book of Job that should solve that whole problem for us. I'm going to read it for you. The Bible said there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. He shunned evil. He feared God and shunned evil. So that tells me one thing. He did not sin. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. He shunned evil. See, the Bible means what he says and says what it means. He feared God. And okay, let me read another, another translation. Maybe that will help. English Standard Version. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless. And upright, who feared God and turned away from evil. What did Job do? And we know the whole story. Satan went to heaven. Not even about Job. He just went to heaven. And God now asked him, have you seen my servant Job? And a conversation ensued. And Satan made a categorical statement. You know, the Bible says when the sons of God gathered, that Satan came to present himself. And God now asked him, have you considered my servant Job? And see what Satan said. See what Satan said to God. Does Job fear God for no reason? Say, have you put a hedge round him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. This is from the enemy stating clearly that Job had a hedge round about him. This tells us that Job was a touch knot. So what did Job do? The only offense we can say, it's never an offense. The only thing you can say that Job did is that maybe he lived in fear. Because when everything happened, he said, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. That's, that's not the point I want to make here. The point I want to make here is we need to stop attributing one thing or the other as reason for evil being done on somebody. Satan has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That is his job. That is the only thing he does. We need to stop. We need to stop. Especially in the church, we need to stop it. Attributing evil as if, attributing one thing or the other as the reason why evil has, has come upon somebody. We need to stop it. You know, we've had that mentality. And don't blame us, because most often not, it is the mentality that has been preached from the pulpit. Constantly attributing evil to the works of unrighteousness. It is because you've not done this, because you're not faithful to attending church, you're not faithful in paying your tithe. It's because you did not obey one instruction from the pastor, or one thing or the other. It is because of this. It is because of that. That is why evil has come upon you. The one I hate most, and I will say it, is when we attribute one reason, or the other to the reason why somebody is barren. We we'll say okay, because she's she's barren because of this. 
because of that. Stop it. Who made you the judge of God's people? Stop it. Who made you the judge of God's people? Isn't it clear in the Bible that Jesus told us not to judge? Why are you judging? Another one is, yeah, it's because of that. That's why she's not married. It's because she's this. Because she's that. That's why she's not married. Stop it. We need to stop it. Stop it. We've turned too far to see people and they start to see. Who made you a Pharisee and a Sadducee in God's church? Stop it. We need to start preaching love. We need to leave all these works of, of works of unrighteousness or works of righteousness. See, Jesus has died. We are God's righteousness in Christ Jesus. We do not do anything to earn it. The sooner we get that into our skull and start working in the newness of life, the sooner all these predicaments will leave us and leave the church. We didn't work for it. You don't even need to work for it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should, we should go and say because guess what? But that is not the point here. The point here is that we need to change our paradigm that it is because of one thing or the other that is why so, so, and so is happening to us. We need to stop it. Do you know that's what Job's friend kept on saying? That's because he did this or that. They came to console him. Before they even came, his wife has already said that he should curse God and die. Imagine, a woman that's supposed to be supportive was the one that is now ganging up against the guy. Now, this is one of the things Job's friend said. Chapter 4 of Job. This is one of the things they said, which is exactly what some of us do today to people that are going through stuff. He said that Job was living in a secret state. That's why he's raping all these things now. Exactly what we do now today. A lot of believers are elephasis. Claiming they know what that person did or what that person did not do as reason why they are going through stuff. Everything, all the goodness that Job is doing or was doing was to truly cover the evil and his wickedness. Who, who gave them the right? Verse 7 said, you are not innocent. He said, you are not righteous. Verse 8 says, you are sowing iniquity. Suppose so it's because of lack of prayerlessness. That is why things are happening to them. I'm not against prayer. I believe in prayer. But who made you a judge? See another one. They say God is correcting you. Verse 17. They say if you are righteous, you would have hidden from the scourge of the tongue and would not be afraid of destruction. They say your children were killed because of your sin. He say you are not pure or upright. That is why God will not hear your prayer and prosper you. They say you are a hypocrite. They say you are not perfect. You are an evil doer. When you read from verse 20. They say in chapter 11, verse 2, that you seek to justify yourself. That is why. They say you are a liar. Verse 11, chapter 11, verse 3. They say you are a mocker. In verse 4 of chapter 11, you claim your doctrine is pure and that you are clean, but you are reaping, that what you are reaping proves the contrary. They said a lot of things, a lot of things. But meanwhile, the Bible made it clear in verse 1 of Job chapter 1 that this man was not any of those things they claimed he was. By the time Job's friend kept on accusing him and he kept on responding, God appeared on the scene and said a lot of things and reprimanded Job. And Job responded in chapter 42 from verse 2 to verse 7. I'll just break it down. See the first thing Job said to God. He said, Lord, I'm sorry. I know you know everything. The second thing he said, no thought can be without from you. He said, I've hidden cancer without knowledge. Those are his friends talking trash to him. He said, I've also uttered what I didn't understand. He now also said something. He said, you know, I hear what you have to say to me. I want an answer from you. He said, I've heard of you by the ear. Now I want to see you. He said, I bore myself and repent in dust and ashes. See what Job did. He did not, after he has wondered what he must have done wrong, he said a lot of things. He did one thing. He repented. Repentant. So especially for you, that thing is because of one thing you did. You didn't pay your tithe. You are not faithful to God. You did one thing or the other. No. All you just need to do is to repent. Confess your sin and repent. Let me declare in 1 John 1 verse 9. If you will confess your sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. No matter what you've done, just confess and repent. That doesn't mean that God will pun is punishing you because of your past sins. Yes, I know there's punishment, there's consequences of every wrong action. But usually that is not the case. But even if you did something wrong, ask for forgiveness. Once you ask for forgiveness, the Bible has made it clear that God is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins. And once he forgives, he cannot hold it against you anymore. He throws it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to remember it. You know, a preacher put it this way. He said, God has forgiven, has thrown our sins 
into the sea of forgetfulness. And he put a sign right there at the beach, at the bank of the river, and said, no fishing. Even to Satan, you should not go back there and fish out your past errors. He doesn't want to hear about it anymore. He made this happen. Do you know what happened? He made this happen. Do you know what God did? He turned around to his friends and reprimanded them. See what he said in verse 7 of Job 42. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, and the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Timonite, do you know what he said to him? He said, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my friend Job has. Meaning that all those things they accused Job of was not right. Hear me well, friends. Don't go assuming what is and what is not about people going through things. Don't go assuming and saying that it is because of this or because of that, that is why they are suffering. Don't do that. If we did not have a backstory of Job's case, we would have all assumed by verse 1 of chapter 1, the beginning of this story told us that this man was upright, feared God, and eschewed evil. Let's stop it. And we live in the dispensation of grace. Where God's grace is super abundant for us. God is our father. God is our father. And he's love. He's not going about seeking to punish us for one thing or the other. He's not following us up and down to see what evil or what wrong thing or what sin we've done or committed. He's not doing that. That is Satan's job. He's the accuser of brethren. God is not doing that. So never, never attribute any evil to what you've done or what you've not done. I want to read something about God's love for you from the scriptures. Psalm 36 in the message translation. See, God's love is meteoric. His love is astronomic. His love is titanic. His verdict, oceanic. Yet in his largeness, nothing gets lost. Not a man, not a mouse, slips through the cracks. Verse 7 says, How exquisite your love, O God! How eager we are to run under your wings. This should be our reaction. When things are not working out as you expected, when things appear as if they are going wrong, when everything around you stops it, Toby, it is the time to run to love. It's not a time to sit and throw a pity party about what you did or what you didn't do. It's not a time to sit wondering, is it what I did 20 years ago, some light years ago, that has come back to haunt me? No, it is time to run into the embrace of God's love. See, that's what David is talking about here. See how eager, you should be eager to run under his wings because his love is exquisite. He said to eat our fill at your banquet, you spread, as you have filled our tankards with Eden spring water. See what else he said. He said, you are a fountain of cascading light, and you open your eyes to light. See verse 10 to verse 12. Keep on loving your friends. That's what God does. His love is not on pause and play. His love is everlasting, what the Bible says. He doesn't love us when we do good or do right and he hates us when we do wrong. The truth even says that he loves us more when we do wrong. You do know why? The Bible says that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't love us just because we are doing right. He loved us just because we are doing wrong. Let me finish reading this. He said, keep on loving your friends. Do your work in welcoming hearts. Say, don't let bullies kick me around. That's what I'm talking about. Don't let anybody teach you, tell you that because of something wrong you did. That's why this is happening. They are bullies. He said, don't let the bullies kick me around. The moral maggots slap me down. Those guys that do that feel their moral. You know what Jesus said? He that is without sin should cast the first stone. If you think you are so moral, if you think you are without sin, cast the first stone. And the beauty about that story is that those men, that brother one woman they caught in fornication or adultery knew that they were not without sin. And they dropped their stones and walked out. 
But in our day, you still see those men that are full of sin, throwing stones. I'll read that again. Keep on loving your friends. Do your work in welcoming hearts. Don't let the bullies kick me around. The moral midgets slap me down. Send the upstart sprawling flat on their face in the mud. And I decree today, that is what will happen to everyone that accuses you. That's what will happen to everyone that thinks they are moral. Pointing fingers at you. Saying it's because of this or that. It will happen to each and every one of them. They will go sprawling on the ground. Because no man is without sin. So my brothers, my sisters, the aim of this video is to first remind you of God's love. God is not seeking to deal with you. He's not seeking to punish you. He's a father. He loves us. He's seeking to help you. He wants you to run to him. That should be your first point of call. Don't throw pity parties. Don't go accusing yourself. That is the job of the accuser. Don't accuse yourself of what you've done or what you've not done. That is the job of the accuser. Secondly, he's a God of grace. No matter what you might have even done, I don't care if you've done one million abortions and you're wondering that is the reason why you won't have a child. God is a God of grace and part of that grace is to ensure that your joy is full. That's what he talked about. Even if something is wrong in your reproductive system because of your past action, just embrace his love and his healing power will come upon you. And I say this because I was wayward. I was a street girl. I messed up. I lived a rough life. That is why no man wants to marry me now. And I'm getting old. My sister, listen to me. God is a God of love. He is a God of mercy. That is not the reason. If that is the reason, then Jesus should not have, as his great, 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 great grandmom, a harlot. He should not have it. And guess what? This happened not even in the dispensation of grace. This happened during the time of the law. Under the law, a woman that was a harlot, Second, she was not of the commonwealth of Israel. She joined the lineage of Christ. And it happened not even in the division of grace. If that could happen under the law, is he you under grace now that should not marry? You're wondering, oh, I was a court boy. We did a lot of things. We killed people. That is why I'm suffering today. Once there is repentance, all these evils are cleared out. Once there is repentance, no matter what you've done in the past, it is erased totally because that is the dispensation we're living in. Whatever, name it, whatever you think, maybe you think your own sin is the worst. I don't care. Jesus' blood is potent. The blood of Jesus has washed away every sin. No matter how bad, ridiculous the sin is, the blood of Jesus is potent. If you think that your past sin is too heinous, too bad, that God can forgive you. Do you know what you're doing? You are stepping on. You are treading on the blood of Jesus. So my friends, stop it. Don't accuse yourself. And brethren, don't accuse brothers. Don't judge. It is not your place to come bless you. It is time to live the higher life. Translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh is Lord. Spirit of Jesus, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person, living within us. Pronounced Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, Yahweh.